Let me do this, um, I'll do this briefly. Um, we've been in a three-part series that's going to culminate today. And so I'm going to move very, very fast because I want to share some new things with you this morning. The first we could begin this with the fact that God favors you. Repeat out of me. Say self. self. God, favors me. God favors me. One more time. Say self. self. God, favors God favors me. Very, very important for you to hear that. And you can read those things on the screen. I'm not going to belabor you with the point because I want to keep moving. And I want to encourage you to, um, you can go to our um, network channel, RCF Network channel. You can go to iTunes. You can go to YouTube and download those sermons. I think they'll be a blessing to you um, as it relates to what God is saying. And then last week, we spent some time talking about this, the fact that we need to wake up and obey God, right? Yeah. The first week, we look at um, Mary's word, how she received that word from the Lord. And then the second week, we followed, up, followed it up with the fact that when we hear from God, looking through the lens of Joseph, that we must get to the place where God, uh, we wake up and obey God. The thing that I like about this is number two, where it says God will intervene to protect his word over your life. I really, really like that. Um, and, and I know I'm doing this out of context because some of you all have not been tracking with us on the series, is that when God releases a word, does anyone in here know that his word cannot return to him void? Amen. Come on, say amen. If, amen. Come on, don't fool me now. If you believe that, say amen to know that God's word, yeah, cannot return to him void. Today I want to jump, there's a subtle ring in this thing here. I want to jump to uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, go to Luke chapter 2 with me. And then I want to read the first eight verses, first seven verses, and then we'll talk through that this morning to hear and receive and see what God is saying. So Luke chapter 2, and then I'm going to look at verses 1 through 7. Let me know you're there by saying amen. amen. Here's what it reads. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, in those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Some of your translation says tax. Some of your translation says a a census was taken. Verse 2 says, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And I love this phrase. It says, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Verse 8 says, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. It says, because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, traditionally, when you have heard this passage read, and you may have heard messages from this passage. Traditionally, most preachers or most speakers will end on that last verse and focus on the fact that there was no room for them in the inn. But today, I want to show you in this passage, and I want you to see yourself through the lens of the fact that what God did for Joseph and Mary, God wants to do for you. Amen? Because remember with me, God favors you. We ought to wake up and obey God. And so today I want to look at something through a, a little different lens tonight to hear. So here's what I want you to take away from this message. God providentially creates the sets of circumstances to position us for destiny so that while there, we can give birth to the child. And if you've been tracking with me, there's something in you, come on, that God has deposited. Come on, say Amen. There's something in you that God has deposited, and because God's going to always protect his word, he won't let his word return to him void, he will do what he needs to do to get us to where he wants us to be. So as we look at this text, I want to share just three brief things with you so we can walk through it to hear what God is saying. And the first thing, look with me, look with me at verse 1 and 2. Let's read this, and then we'll talk to it a little bit. So before we even read, I want you to turn your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, you have been positioned for destiny. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, you have been positioned for destiny. Point to yourself and say, self, I have been positioned for destiny. Amen. Very, very important that you not miss that. Amen. So here are three things I want to share with you, and I'm going to move quick. The first thing I want you to take away from the message is this, that God is providentially involved in every aspect of our life. Okay? Um, Hear me say this. You are no accident with God. 
Hear, hear me also say this, that where you are, God has positioned you strategic, strategically because he has purpose, he has destiny, he has something that he created you to do, and God is going to ensure that what God created you to do gets done in his timing and in his way. Amen? So here's a concept I want to take, take, allow you to take away. And if you've been here any length of time, you might have heard me speak about this because I have a habit of just repeating things so people can get it. Repeat out of me. Say divine providence. Divine providence. Say it again. Say divine providence. divine providence. Here is what providence means. Divine providence speaks to this. Does God allowing us to go through circumstances and situations in our life to position us or to prepare us for the next series of events that we're going to go through in life. That's what divine providence is, right? So, so what it says is that God allows me to go through circumstance. He allows me to go through trials. He allows me to go through certain things such that at the end of that thing, I am now equipped for the next assignment that God has in store for me. You might know it this way in the New Testament in Romans 8 and 28. In all things... God works together for the good to those who love him. Come on. To those who are called according to his purpose. You've heard songwriters wrote song about it that says he's working it out for your good. Does anybody believe that this morning? In case, in case you're struggling with an example of what that looks like, let me give you one. A very familiar example in the life of Joseph. Divine providence can look like this. It's, divine providence can be God allowing Joseph in the book of Genesis to be favored by his dad, such that his dad gives him a coat of many colors, so that his brothers can hate him because he's favored by his dad, so that his brothers could take him out in the field and place him in a pit. Come on, are you tracking with me? So that while in the pit, some Egyptians can pass by and he can be pulled from the pit and sold into slavery by Potiphar. So that when he can go into now Potiphar's house and that Potiphar's wife ends up tempting him so he can end up in the dungeon. This is providence. So that while in the dungeon, he will encounter the baker and the butler. Come on, y'all track with me. So that the baker and the butler can have dreams and he can interpret their dreams. So that this baker and butler can be released from prison and end up now serving um, the Egyptian pharaoh. So that when Pharaoh has a dream, he has a per person positioned next to him that says, I know someone that can interpret their dream. Come on, y'all not getting me. So that Pharaoh can call for this guy who started out, he was angry over the fact that his brother sold him into slavery so that God could take him through the sets of circumstance to position him from the pit all the way to the palace, right? Divine providence is God working all things for the good of those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. Here's the beauty of the providential intervention of God. There is no wasted time. Come on. There are no wasted incidents. There are no wasted trials. There are no wasted circumstances. Come on, you're not hearing me this morning. Maybe you don't believe me yet, but here's divine providence again, right? God allowing, now that the Egyptians are in Egypt, and they've been crying out to the Lord after 400 years of being in slavery, he allows this fellow by the name of Moses to be born. Come on, y'all know this. And Moses, now I want you to see the full circle of God. Pharaoh now, I mean, the Egyptian ruler now issues this edict that all children two years and under should be killed so that, uh, uh, what's this, Moses' mom can hide him in, in the river so that his sister Miriam can be positioned to oversee the baby so that that Pharaoh's daughter can come take a bath in the same river. Y'all not hearing me. So that Miriam would be there and Pharaoh's daughter would take Moses and put him to rear him in the very house that God was going to call him to, to go back, uh, y'all not hearing me, and deliver the people so that 40 years later after he's killed the Egyptian and he is out and running, God can say to him, I allowed you to go through everything you went through, y'all not hearing me. God using those sets of circumstance to position us to where we want to be. That's divine providence. I'm going to say this way again. You're, not, you're no accident with God. Where you are, God has strategically positioned you because God needs you to be positioned so he can use you to do what he wants you to do. 
I'm comfortable in saying the reason that I'm here this morning is the providential intervention of God, right? You're looking at a guy that's born in South America, and you're probably saying, what in the world? How did you make that sojourn to come from South America all the way here on a Sunday morning to speak with you? Let alone, how did you find this woman in Arizona to marry? Y'all not hearing me this morning. It is God shifting me, God taking me, God moving us through places to position us so we can be who God would have us to be. This is what we see in the text this morning. When you look at this text, we see a story of a young man by the name of Joseph and a young lady by the name of Mary that God has destined for purpose, God has created to do a unique thing in the earth realm. But the problem, as we're going to see, God must get involved providentially to kind of move them to get them to be where God would have them to be. So listen, number one, come on, say, God is providentially involved in every aspect of my life. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Now, here's the second thing I want you to take away from the text, and we're going to walk through this. Not only is God involved, but here's what God will do. God will use life circumstances. This, you're not going to like this. To create the shift necessary to position us to the next place of assignment. You're not going to like that. You're not going to like that because you're still mad at what happened the last time. <laughs> Come on, talk to me this morning. You're not going to like that. You're still hanging on to the issues and the struggles of the divorce. You don't like the fact that he's gotten remarried and he, come on, he's moved on and you're still there. You're not going to like this because you're still mad with the last and poor lawyer. Come on, talk to me this morning. But, but I want you to hear me say, I want you to hear me say, he will use life circumstances to create the shift necessary to position us to our next place of assignment. Let's go to work. Let's look at the text and let's talk through it so we can hear and see what God is saying. So notice, look, look, look with me at, what is it, verse 3. Let me read verse 1, then we're going to read all the way to verse 5 for context. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, and my Bible said because he was the house and lineage of David to be registered with um, his betrothed Mary, who was with child. Now, here's what I need you to see in this text. As simple as this narrative is, and as beautiful in as many years as we've been listening to this text, there's a problem with the text. And the problem with the text is this. It was prophesied in the Old Testament in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that this Christ child needed to enter the earth, but with the child entering the earth, the prophetic utterance was he was not going to be born in Nazareth, but his birthplace was supposed to be Bethlehem, Judea. Now, what I need you to see in the text is that at the time of Mary's pregnancy, at the time of a betrothal, and you need to listen to the other sermon series to get interpretation for some of these terms that I'm using, Joseph was out of position. Oh, come on, say amen. Y'all been good Sunday school people, you know this. He was out of position, and here he was in Nazareth, but Micah 5 and all the Old Testament prophesied that this child that was going to enter the earth realm was going to be a descendant of David, right? So notice the text. All of a sudden, as you're looking at this text, you take it for granted that this leader of the Roman Empire, Quirinius, who was governor at the time, calls a census. And notice the purpose of the census is to get everyone to go back to their place of birth, right? And, 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 and don't, don't make the mistake of, of taking lightly the issue of this census being called. There's divine intention with that. And what I want you to see in the text is that God has a way that when we find ourselves out of position, oh, come on, come on, come on, he will cause the right sets of circumstance and the right things to happen to get us to end up where he ultimately wants us to be. What I love about the text, if you know anything about repetition in the biblical time, that word, that, that word registration is used four times in those 
three or four verses that it's used there from verses one all the way through seven, which says it's a very, very important word that needs to be um, fleshed out and understood and talked about. So here's what that word means. All it means, it's a very simple definition. It means to go to a place to put your name on the list. I, I think I'm done up here. Yeah. It, it means to go to a place to put your name on a list. So here's what that means. Apographos is the Greek word, and what it means is that, that the census was called, and then when you follow the census or the registration, you end up going to a particular place, and your name ends up being on the registrar or the registration of the list. So here's, you know it this way, you know it this way. It's the receipt you get in the form of a birth certificate. Come on, talk to me, right? And, and, and here's what the birth certificate says. It says your state of birth or your country of birth, and it says your city and or county of birth. Come on, are you tracking with me? The reason this is important information, because as I stated, Micah 5, 2 said that Jesus' birth certificate was not supposed to say Nazareth, come on, Galilee, come on, y'all talk to me, talk to me. And the reason that is important is because God's word cannot return to him void. Here's what can, could not have happened in the text. That Jesus' birth certificate could not say um, Nazareth because the prophecy was given, and here's what the angels could not say to God, oops, you messed up. So what God will do he created the sets of circumstances to cause Jesus to be shifted. Now, it's true, it's the same thing, because what the registrar says, it speaks to the place that you're being born. This is free, and let me get ahead of myself for a little while. You gotta understand this. Notice this, when you gave your life to Christ, here's what the Bible says, you registered somewhere. In other words, here's what it said, this is free. Your name was written where? In the book. Yeah, the Lamb's book of life. You kind of get what I'm saying. And lock into this. For some of us, God didn't want us born in the places where we used to hang out. Y'all not hearing me this morning. So he created the sets of circumstances to shift us so that when we were in the right place, we can give birth. We were born into his family. He wrote our name on the book of life. And lock into what happens when he returns for his church. Here's what he does. He comes with the registration. Y'all not hearing me this morning. He comes, this is free, this is not even part of the message. He comes with the registration, and here's what it says, whosoever name was not written where in the, y'all not, come on, you'll know this this morning. Just turn to him and say, neighbor, have you registered yet? Come on, tell him, have you registered yet? Have you registered yet? So lock into this, lock into this. Let me press on, let me press on, because I don't have much time. Lock into this. The, the goal of God was that Jesus be born where he was, so he caused the census. And what's striking about the census, don't make yourself fool yourself into thinking it was a cultural norm. Government had shifted, and this new government had taken place. And I find the time moment of God amazing that at the moment the shift happened, Mary finds herself pregnant, and the baby's about to be born, and the right sense of circumstances circumstances aligned so Joseph ends up having to move from where he is to be positioned to where God needs him so the child can be born. Now here's a free application. I want y'all to take away this. The reason a lot of us have not given birth yet is because we're fighting against the census. Yeah, let me English. We get comfortable where we is. And God is doing one of these numbers. God is pushing. Four censuses have been called. Come on, y'all not hear me. A whole lot of, you know you should be gone. You know you should leave because God didn't destine you to create the thing or give birth to the thing there. But we're fighting against the providence of God. And if you know anything about God, you can fight all you want, but guess who's going to win? Let me give you a biblical example. You all know this fellow well, the guy by the name of Jonah. The census was that you need to go to Nineveh. And to, so here's what he does. He goes the other direction. But does anybody know you can run? 
Tell your neighbor, stop running. Come on, tell them, stop running, stop running, stop running. God will create the sets of circumstances. It was the will of God that this baby be born where the baby was supposed to be born prophetically so God will shift, God will move, God will direct, God will adjust, God will do whatever God needs to do to get it right. Lock into this. The providence of God was that Joseph in the Old Testament be in Egypt so when the timing is right, he can deliver the people of God. The providence of God was that Moses be positioned so when the timing is right, he can deliver the people of God. The providence of God is this, was that Joseph be positioned, I mean, who was it? Um, David be positioned so when Goliath showed up, you get what I'm saying? God will push. Come on, say to himself, say self. God will push. Say it again, say God will push. One more time, say, God will push. push. Let me show you a scripture. Let me show you a scripture that I really like. Here's a passage in Acts chapter 17, right? Here's what it says in Acts chapter 17, and I want you all to get this. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. I love this verse. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit who? The whole earth. And he determined the times set for them. And I love this. The what? Exact places where they should live. And lock into this. And he did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and do what? Find him though he is not far from each one of us. And here you bragging to your friends, I got here because my company relocated me. (laughs) No, no, you don't understand. God called your boss to call for a census because God, oh, y'all come on, come on, talk to me. And here, here you talking about, I spent 40 years in the military, and I've been here, and I've been there, and I got repositioned by the military. No, no, no. God needed you in Japan to learn some things, so he took you in Japan. Come on. God needed you in California to learn some things, so he put you in California. Y'all not hearing me. God needed you in Arizona to learn some things, so he put you in Arizona. But his ultimate destiny in this season of your life is where you are right now, and Romans 8 and 28 says, he worked all things out for his good to position us where he wants us to be. That's God. That's God. Come on, y'all. That's God. The providential intervention of God. Are you tracking with me? Here's the last thing I want to share with you because I don't want to keep you long. This, this, I love this one. Here's, here's what I want y'all to get. With God, proper positioning always precedes timing. Let y'all, <laughs> let that marinate a little bit. Yeah. With God, proper positioning always precedes timing. Let me help you because we've messed this text up. So let's look at the text. Let me show you this in text. Verse 8. Verse 6 says, and while they were there, The time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her first son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him where? Why? Because there was what? Yeah. Look at verse 6. And while they were there, the time came. And while they were there, the time came. One time. (laughs) And while they were there, the time came. The reason you're wrestling with the statement in the text right now is because you've allowed media to paint a picture of the interpretation of this passage. And when you look at this text, because we didn't do the work necessary, we envision Pharaoh or who is it, Caesar Augustus, issuing issuing this edict of a taxation, and you have a visual in your mind of a mass exodus from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So here's what you see. You have a depiction of the Egyptian exodus. 
and you see a bunch of folk on donkeys and camels, come on, talk to me, and dragon stuff, making this huge sojourn to get down to Bethlehem to register for the tax taxation. Matter of fact, we've got pictures drawn about that, right? And, and let me tell you the challenge, the, the fallacy I want you all to take into that. This is not a day and age when they had the mechanisms and the systems that we have today where you can just go to the voting booth and punch a number or you can log into your social media account and just register. Rome was not positioned to facilitate such a mass movement or interest of people should they enter Bethlehem at that particular point in time. So here's what I need you to know. They were given, historically and culturally, approximately a year's worth of time to make the journey. And what that allowed for is that it allowed for people on their own time, uh, any time do, in, during that year, to make the journey to, come on, come on, come on, come on. Are you with me? So, so don't, don't, don't visualize for a moment this, this mass exodus of people making the journey at the same time. The other problem with the text is this, is that when we interpret this text, we have this mindset that Mary was in her last day of her pregnancy. Here's how we interpret this text. This pregnant woman that's about to drop the baby at any particular point in time, and we see Joseph now pulling this donkey, and, and here's because the text says there's no room for them at the end, here's what we do. We go and we see this guy knocking on doors and says, hey, my wife is about to deliver the baby anytime. Do you have any room? And you see innkeepers saying, no room. Come on, talk to me. This is how we've been thinking. We see him going to the next inn and knocking on the door saying, my wife is pregnant. And, and we have pictures of Mary holding her stomach as if she's in labor pains because the baby is about to be delivered at any time. And we hear them saying there is no room. And we see Joseph, come on, talk to me, going from place to place as if he was in crisis because the baby is about to be born any time. Lock into this. Joseph was not going to a strange land. He's going home. <laughs> Y'all know this. The reason, the reason, if you follow Matthew, Matthew 1 is not there accidentally. He was a descendant of this and a descendant of that and a descendant of that. Come on. And a descendant of that and a descendant of that. Matter of fact, if, if Joseph wanted to pull rank, all he had to do was show up in Bethlehem and say, you know who my granddaddy is? Oh, y'all not know, y'all not. Come on, track with me. It was the city of David. Come on, are you hearing me? He, the author said clearly that he was a descendant of David, and all he was doing was going home to register for the taxation. So lock into this. His family lived there. Y'all know this. Come on. They weren't broke. He was the son of a carpenter. Y'all know this. Business owner. They had homes. They had land. They had all that stuff going on. So it was not a crisis situation. And the reason for the year is Joseph showed up. And here's the importance of that word translated in. It was a room attached to the main house. And here it is. I'm saying this for a reason. The family is there. Joseph and Mary shows up. And here's what they say historically and culturally. When he got there, because all the family was there. Remember, Mary was what? 13, 12 to 13, 14. Joseph is 20. And Joseph had family members that were older than him. And understand with me, this is Felix now. They might have been resting with the fact that you got this young girl pregnant. You think somebody was going to give up a bedroom? Oh, Y'all not tracking with me. <laughs> Pious Jews. Teach. Teach. Come on. Best we can do is we can put you in the guest house. Now, I wish we had some Africans in here from Ethiopia that can verify what I'm about to say. If you're from a third world country, here's what you don't do. You don't leave your animals on the outside for the neighbors to steal at night while you're going to sleep. Those of you that's been on mission trips know what I'm talking about if you've been to those remote villages. So at night, in the guest house on the outside, they'd bring the animals on. I wish I had somebody. <laughs> on the inside. Come on, y'all. 
to protect them. So here's what they did. So Joseph was there. He had got there in time. And the place where he settled was where they placed him was on, in, in the guest room because the main house had no room for him. They ran out of bedrooms in his family's house. Here's the point I want to say. He was positioned before the timing. It wasn't a crisis. It wasn't a crisis, okay? And I want to point that out because you need to hear me say this in your individual life. God will position you. Come on. And give you time to be positioned to process what he needs done. And then while positioned, after the position in, the timing comes for the baby to be born. Now that's important because a whole lot of us want to give birth, want to say now is my time, now is my season, now is this, but you still in Nazareth. Y'all, y'all, yeah. And the prophet is, while you were in Nazareth, you were supposed to do what needs to be done in Nazareth, but there might be a next, see, I wish I had somebody in here in your life where the next prophecy for you is you need to be positioned here or you need to be positioned over there and you're trying to give birth to something that can't happen because God's word is not going to return to him void. And a lot of us are struggling in life, business, marriage, homes, ministry, you name it, in Nazareth, trying to give birth to things that can only be born in Bethlehem. Yes. Call me blasphemous, but there's no way on God's earth that baby could have been born in Nazareth. Call me blasphemous. She'd have been the first 15-month pregnancy had they not make the journey. And the reason some of us have been pregnant for 40 years the reason your thing can't come out here and be born here is because you're not destined for that place. Oh, come on. Come on. The reason you can't get the raise on the job and you're afraid to leave. I want, come on, there's many applications. Come on, is this making sense? Yeah. Many applications. The reason stuff isn't right in your home. On and on and on and on and on. I know this is about Joseph and I know this is about Mary, but I want to show you how it connects to you because God favors you just like he favored Mary. Come on, just like he favored Joseph. And God's word is not going to return void. So hear me, where God has you right now, you better find out from God what he needs out of you in this season where he has you positioned. Is this making sense? Is this making sense? Very, very important that we not miss that because here's what's going to happen. With God, proper positioning always proceeds timing. I'm done with this. Listen to this. There's no way David could have fought Goliath while he was feeding the sheep. So notice what God did. Calls his daddy to call him. Hey, David, your brothers are hungry. Can you take them something to eat? Call for a census. And what does David do? Sure. Then he goes. And all of a sudden, he's positioned in the Valley of Elah. Then the timing was right. Goliath comes out. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all y'all not hearing me. Y'all not, not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Hear me. The timing was not while he was in the wilderness. The timing was when he got to Elah. And Goliath comes out. And here's, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Listen to what I'm going to say. That defies the army of the living God. Let me at him. Here's Saul, here's, here, here's Saul, here's Saul. You're a boy. Here's what David said. You don't understand divine providence. <laughs> the same God that took me to the bear. Come on. And the lion, come on, that same God has equipped me for the assignment that he has for me to do right in this place where he has positioned me. Bring Goliath on. So listen, y'all. Your life experiences 
was the education you needed for the next assignment. Go ahead and give birth. <laughs> Go ahead and give birth. Let that thing out. Because there's something he needs out of you. Why? Because he wants the world to know who he is. Look at the text and I'm done. Look at this. Come on, Pastor Tani. It says here, they laid him in a manger to give birth to his firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Here's my prayer this morning. Man, I've been wounded. I've been abused. I've been hurt. Been through a lot of things. And it's still until I got a revelation of what divine providence is and the registration. God shifting. God shifting. That I realize I can sit here and wallow in my stuff all day long and say, woe is me. Or I can get busy and realize that God allowed me to go through that for the next thing he has in store for me. And if you're sitting here and you're missing God, I want to challenge us this morning. Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you right where you are. Allow God to move. Allow to have him to have his way. You have been positioned for destiny. Don't delay the hour and the timing of God. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, you're awesome. You're wonderful, God. You're kind. You're merciful. Thank you for your word. As we studied and we saw what was happening in the life of Joseph, the life of Mary, even in this season of Advent, God, we can see ourselves. We repent. Forgive us, God, for missing you. Align us, God, for the next assignment so we can be about you. The word still remains. The harvest is ripe. The problem is the labor is God. Teach us to work while it's day for night comes when no man can work. So we thank you for sending your son into this world. And we see your intervention, God. So we walk with you. We adjust with you. Help us heal. Help us process. Help us be about you, God. Because the pit does not define who we are. We're not created for the pit. We're destined for the throne. The pit was just a lesson. Let's not dwell there. So if there's one here that don't know you, God, you draw them. Bring them for a relationship with you. And thank you for what you're going to do. We give ourselves to you, God.